Thank you, Megan. Uh, so FWRV is the host for today's Blue Ribbon Producers Panel, and I cannot wait to, uh, to listen to the uh, expert insights from uh, our panelists today. Um, and let's meet our moderator, who is my colleague at FWRV, the senior partner, perhaps the smartest man I know when it comes to the law and, and independent film and, and, <laughs> and pretty much everything else. But I have the, I have, uh, the chance to have him as a colleague and, and as a mentor. So it's, it's an honor for me to introduce to you Ken Wyreb, who will be hosting this Blue Ribbon panel on, on, on producers. We have an august panel today. Um, uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce them and then we're going to go through it. They're going to introduce themselves and what they uh, are doing in particular James Belfer from Dogfish Pictures, founder and CEO, Alex Cirillo from Big Vision Empty Wallet, Jake Levy, a brilliant also attorney from Franklin Wine and Uh Moral Mueller, the producer of uh, Copenhagen, a wonderful film you should all see, uh, Brian Quattrini, a wonderful producer also from Minerva Productions, Mike Nichols, Abel Sine, I think I pronounced that right, rental manager, and the inestimable Emily Best from Seed and Spark. So, James. So, uh, uh, I'm James Belfer. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Dogfish Pictures. Uh, I uh, helped finance and produce uh, six films so far, uh, the most noted of which are Like Crazy, Compliance, and Prince Avalanche. And uh, about a year ago, almost today, Emily, when, was, when, when did we do the first Innovators Brunch last year? It was, it was a year ago today. Was Actually, it really a year ago today? It was a year ago right now. So literally a year ago right now, we officially announced what we call the Dogfish Accelerator Program, uh, which we ran our first class uh, this past September, where we help uh, producers learn entrepreneurial practices. I'm Alex Cirillo from Big Vision Empty Wallet. I'm sorry, I have no voice, but I'll do my best to let you hear me. Um, <clears throat> so Big Vision Empty Wallet is a membership community. We have members all over the world, primarily producers, but creators of all kinds. Um, and we provide them with resources and access to people and companies that can help them create better, smarter, faster, cheaper. Um, and we also, uh, we do panels just like this, and we've been live streaming all the panels from the New York Lounge on bigvisionfdwallet.com. So if you have any friends at home right now uh, who you think would be interested in checking this out, uh, you can send them there, and we're doing a Twitter discussion using the hashtag NYNPC New York in Park City. Um, so they can follow at home. And we also, in addition to Big Vision Empty Wallet, have uh, Big Vision Creative. And my business partner, Danny Leonard, and I um, produce and consult on projects uh, through Big Vision Creative. And you're a badass producer in your own right. Oh, yeah, and I'm a producer. That's why I'm on the panel. Badass. <laughs> I'm Jake Levy. I'm an entertainment lawyer at Franklin Wine Rib Rudell and Vassallo, or FWRV. We are a full-service entertainment law firm, which means we advise clients in all areas of entertainment law, be it motion pictures, which is why we're here, but also television, music, book publishing, theater, uh, any area you can think of related to entertainment, we do it. Um, in, protect, in particular, in the independent film world, we advise producers and production companies uh, throughout their process, uh, starting with development, through financing, production, and distribution. We also advise other participants in the independent film community, such as uh, writers, actors, directors, financiers, um, and we are really excited to be here today. I'm Mauro Müller. I'm uh, the producer of Copenhagen and also founder of Fidelio Films. Fidelio Films is a creative collective of four writer-directors, all graduated from Columbia University. Um, we produce each other's work and we're all from different countries, so we're multinational. Um, we've done a lot of shorts, one in 2012 and 2013, the Student Academy Award with our shorts. Um, one just with another short, the DJ Award in New York on the student level, and Copenhagen is our first feature film. Now we're trying kind of like to bridge um, from shorts into features, so. Love the film, by the way. Hi, 
I'm Brian Quattrini, uh, president of Minerva Productions. Um, I wanted to thank you all for basically coming this morning for Market Trip. Um, we're producing with Four of a Kind Productions. Uh, my partner and wife and partner in life, Anne O'Shea, CEO of Minerva. Um, we've had many of films here. Um, we, we love coming here and we're very honored to be here. So, thank you. I think I got my own. Okay, cool. Morning, everyone. Uh, Mike Nichols from Abel Cine. Um, I apologize for anybody expecting somebody else sitting in this seat. I am a different Mike Nichols. There was there was no um, <laughs> there was no intention there to, to trick anybody to come. It's I'm I'm that's me. Got the birth certificate to prove it. Um, Abel Cine celebrating its 25th year in business, which is amazing. Um, we're a full service production facility. I, you know, I, I, I'm the rental manager, but you know, we do so much more than just rent cameras. We, we try to position ourselves as um, being on the forefront of technology so we could, because a bulk of our clients, at least on the rental side, tend to be first time filmmakers. And rather than creating a warehouse type of mentality for, you know, an atmosphere for them, we try to make it a nurturing experience, one where we can sort of guide the, the production, maybe steer them in, in the right direction when they may not be going in the right direction and just offer, you know, advice and bring them through their, their projects. And, you know, a bulk of our clients, independent film, we, you know, we touch on every aspect of production, commercials, features, music videos, student films, it run, runs the, the wide gamut. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Emily Best. I'm the founder and CEO of Seed and Spark. Um, we are a distribution and crowdfunding platform for independent film. Um, I'm also a producer and a writer, um, and honored to be sitting on the panel with um, such esteemed colleagues. Um, Seed and Spark was really uh, founded to create a seamless experience for audiences, because I think the big question out there is how do we find, engage, keep, foster relationships with um, audiences so that we have better control of our careers and so that as creators we make more money. Thank you. <laughs> um, in today's changing film environment, the studios are caught in a cycle of huge budgets, uh, films or comedies with the same seven actors. Um, uh, the country is coming out of a recession. The uh, crowdfunding rules are changing so that um, those who invest may actually be able to get a return, although there's some debate among us about how helpful that will be, but the rules are going to change in 2014, so it's an exciting time for independent film. James at Dogfish Accelerator, um, we talked a little bit about how you pick a project and the things that you look for in a project and what stands out to you in order for you to uh, become engaged. If you share with sure. us. Uh, so, this is something that I ultimately began to develop this theory through the different productions that I worked on, both on set and also uh, as an active executive producer in the sense of helping with all the, the practices uh, to get a film made and then also uh, monetizing a film, so the bookends as I like to call it. Um, ultimately what I found and what we did with the accelerator is we really prioritize producers over anything else. Um, uh, one thing that I, I've said before is I think there are, are two aspects to a project that I really look for as an investor and then also uh, with the accelerator and that's the strength of the producer team and then the strength of the script and the reason why those two the script is obvious you can't have a good movie with a bad script uh, and the Producers, the reason why I focus more so on them than on the talent, on the, the filmmakers, on uh, the, any, any other form of, of the creative elements is because it's all of the decisions made by the producers, um, whether it's in pre-production, production, post-production, post selling the film, monetizing the film. Um, every decision is made by the producer team, and if there's uh, any misstep, then it needs to ultimately fall on the founders of the film, the producers. So really focusing on uh, can producers execute and are producers entrepreneurial um, really has been what the focus for Dogfish has been. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mauro, you produced this wonderful film in Copenhagen. Um, I, uh, by chance, happen to know that Copenhagen is one of the most expensive cities in the world uh, to live. Uh, I can't imagine it's not also one of the most expensive cities in the world to produce. So I just, if you could share with us how you were able to make 
your film on the budget that you had, um, whether it was local crews, uh, and you know, and how whether it was tax incentives or what you know what was enabled you to do it based on the, the budget that you had. Sure. Maybe I need to start saying that I'm from Switzerland, where it's very expensive too, and I was surprised how expensive Copenhagen actually is. Um, we didn't have any contacts when we decided to make the film in Copenhagen. Um, the director had a relationship, lived there for a year, but really we didn't have any film community um, networking relationship. So we just went two months before the shooting and literally hit up every single contact we had. We had one contact and from that basically we got the recommendations. Uh, we just contacted Cole, Centro, and Nordisk, the bigger companies. and. They were really actually all very helpful because they were excited that someone from New York comes and does an indie project. A lot of them obviously didn't want to get involved because there was no money, but um, we did eventually get a lot of people excited about the project. And we didn't work with tax incentive. We very early on kind of got a sponsorship manager who just tried to literally contact all different clothing companies, food companies. And I think the fact that we were a New York-based company helped a lot. People were very excited. I think also our attitude a little bit of doing something in a foreign country helped because if I would do something in New York or LA, I felt probably a little bit more ashamed to ask for favors. I didn't know those people, so there was no shame level there. Uh, we just literally asked for stuff. Uh, we went to the Danish Film Institute, just walked in there, asked if we could get something. They actually provided an office space. So like this, we started to piece together the entire production. Did you use a tax? Did you use a tax incentive? No, no, no. Um, Just went and spent dollars in Copenhagen. Yeah, we spent dollars in Copenhagen. That's incredible. Um, um, okay, thank you, um, Alex. At the distribution panel, we heard um, two divergent views of distributors. Uh, one group said they very much wanted to be in touch with the filmmakers before to have some influence and conversation about what they were doing, how they were going to market their, move, their film, even before it was produced. We had another view, which is quite contrary, where the distributor said, I don't want to know from it. I, you know, that's your job. You film what you're going to film, and then come talk to me. How do you guys view that? Um, well, we definitely believe that you need to be thinking about distribution from the very beginning. Um, you need to know who your audience is, know where they are, and how to reach them, and you need to be building them f from step one. Um, so. I mean, I would definitely recommend being in touch with distributors if you have those relationships um, as early as possible because you can get advice from them in terms of what they're looking for and they can give you tips on how to uh, put yourself in a really great position to get a good distribution deal. Jake, um, you know, over the years, the number of times producers have come to us and said, um, we need your help. We have distribution on our film, um, so we need you to help us with the distribution arrangement. Which we say, great, you have all of your documents, your chain of title, all the rights, and things start to unravel. So would you just talk us through a little bit about uh, your view about when in the process it would be helpful for, to uh, reach out to council? Absolutely. So if there's one thing to take away from I'm about to tell everyone, it's involve your lawyer as early as possible and it will save you money. And yes, it's a little counterintuitive, but by hiring your lawyer earlier, you're going to save money because you need to do this. When you are ready to go uh, approach investors, you need to be able to show them that you have built a solid foundation. Uh, and if you can't do that, you're not gonna be successful uh, telling investors that you can make a film. It's just not gonna work. Jay, can we make sure, does everybody know what chain of title is? Sorry. It, can you just, it's okay to out yourself. Does everyone know what chain of title is or should we explain yeah. it? I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll explain it, e even if uh, for those people who don't want to raise their hands, because at one point I didn't know what chain of title was. So what chain of title is, is it refers to uh, the process whereby you have secured all the rights that are necessary to produce your film. So. Uh, for a narrative film, this starts with, do you need to acquire rights to any underlying material, like a book or a magazine article? And the answer may be yes or maybe no, but you're probably not going to be able to figure that, that out without coming and speaking to an experienced entertainment lawyer. Um, 
for a documentary film, uh, you uh, may need permission from people uh, who you are featuring in your documentary, or you may not need permission. Or it might be advisable that you get permission from these people because you want a certain kind of access to them that you otherwise can't have. Or maybe you want some sort of exclusivity with them and you don't want them speaking to other people. Uh, they're all things that you should be thinking about. So on, just on a feature film, your chain of title is a stack of documents like this that's like a, all the releases for all the stuff that's in your movie. Sorry, when somebody said chain of title, the thing in my head was like, oh, it'll be sort of, it's just a big file is what it is. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And that's uh, what you hire your entertainment lawyer to help you with so that you can all focus on doing the stuff that you are great at and let us do the stuff that we are great at. So in terms of building that foundation, Emily, yes, chain of title is one of, I think, the two most important parts of the foundation. Um, the other really important part is to make sure that you have the deal between uh, you and your fellow producers, your fellow high-level producers on the film worked out and put in writing. Because Ken, this gets back to your question, so many times we have people come to us during distribution and you're now you're at the, the uh, you know, you're, you're approaching the finish line, you've been working together for years, and now all the stresses of your relationship over the past years come to the forefront. And we ask people, so what's in your LLC operating agreement? Or do you have a joint venture agreement? And it doesn't How are decisions made? Yeah. And how will you be splitting profits? And have you talked about, uh, you know, we hope there aren't any overages from your budget that you haven't spent more money than you've raised. But if you have, how are those going to get divvied up? And you don't want the first time that you're thinking about that to be four years uh, into working on a project. Um, you need to think about these relationship issues early on. And getting back to why that will save you money, it's because it's going to become messy if you do this four years into the process. And potentially, it's going to impede the distribution of your film. Great, thank you. Brian, you've been involved in a number of productions uh, with a variety of different budgets. And I just, in the introduction, I said that the independent film world is changing, there's a lot going on. What are you looking at in terms of a budgetary level that makes sense? You know, look, if you have a huge star and you're going to get huge, you know, foreign advances, that's different. Leaving that out for a moment. The, the normal budgetary level that you're looking at these days, given what you're seeing in the marketplace. Well, um, really, uh, for us, it's more about um, it's more about the script and the story than it is as far as budget goes. Um, I mean, we've been involved with you know micro budgets all the way up you know to large budget you know films, but uh, really, it's what what drives us is you know what the mission is, what our company stands for, and what we want to do with it. Um, so it's really more about. The, the quality of the quality of the project than it is about um, just you know money, um, and uh, back to again I can't believe how poignant this is. We just finished a, a project in London that was shot 24 years ago, and talking about chain of title, it's an Alan Bates film uh, called Sins of a Father um, that wasn't finished because of his death. So the chain of title I never even even thought about that, but um, thank God for lawyers. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, you hear that? <laughs> you know, I know that they're, they're not all at the bottom of the ocean. No, they're not. <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, we we it's more about the, the quality of the uh, the project than it is about budget. We'll get in. We'll jump in at any point along the way. Okay, um, uh, Mike. Again, just the same introduction. The the the. The world is changing, the technological requirements or, or the technological availability, what one can do in film has changed dramatically since the first time I came to Sundance <clears throat> many years ago. So if you could just kind of walk us through what you're seeing in terms of what kind of, give me this, what kind of um, 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 cameras or other kinds of technological things that you're seeing that'll be informative for our, 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 our panel and our, our guests. Yeah, I, I definitely definitely will address that, but I have to, I mean, after hearing the this, this, this speakers, I have to just make a quick point. Before I started working at Able Cine, I produced a film, and I am the cautionary tale of doing everything that they're saying because I didn't do a single thing. You know, as New York filmmakers, we get the, this invincible air about ourselves and how we operate. I could do it, and we get guarded about our very limited resources. I can't afford a lawyer. I can't afford this. I can't, you know, I can't engage 
you know, these these operations that bring resources to filmmakers because of, you know, the fee. But, you know, I found out the hard way that you need to because in the end, when you're going through your chain of title, when you're going through your uh, E&O insurance, and when you're going through everything you need to put together as a filmmaker to get your film out, I mean, I had a very limited, uh, you know, VOD and uh, internet distribution. And it was, I had to navigate it all myself because I just didn't engage anybody like, you know, the, the people that I'm sitting with, and you know, I regret it. And that's why I'm renting cameras instead of producing films now. No. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> work for you. <laughs> hey, I got health insurance. Who could say that? Um, no, but to, to talk about technology, you know, it's. I mean, I started at Able Cine six years ago, and what we were doing six years ago, it's, it's gotten, the best way I could describe it is it's gotten faster exponentially. So from year one to year two, there was a, um, there was a change in technology that was pretty dramatic. You know, the, the independent films were shooting mostly Super 16. HD was kind of touching that market with uh, cameras like the Sony F900 and the Panasonic Vericam. But it was mostly, it wasn't until the Red introduced the, their first camera that digital c cinema filmmaking started to reach the hands of independent filmmakers. Prior to that, it was the really expensive systems that you would only see on the, on the uh, you know, higher end features, the higher budgeted features. But then once the Red hit the market, you know, this, it was like a, you know, the, 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 the genesis, for lack of a better term, of the digital cinema revolution. And then, you know, taking it to today where you've got the, the Alexa and, and Red's uh, Epic and now the Dragon and Sony's F55, F65, there's just so many options. And it's, it can be confusing and daunting for a filmmaker because, you know, what tends to drive their, um, their decision is, is buzz. And what I try to do is I try to say, well, let's remove buzz from the equation. Let's look at your project. Let's see what your budget is and let's see what you're looking to achieve. If you, you may not need to spend the dollars that you think you need to spend on a project based on what you're, what you're delivering and what you're shooting. And it's just, it could be, it could be daunting. So, you know, we try to take the cameras, at, uh, the buzz out of the equation of when selecting cameras. And right now it's, I mean, it is an amazing time to be an independent filmmaker. There are so many avenues that you can have your, your project seen. You know, the fantasy of having the, the theatrical premiere and, uh, you know, that, that's, I think that's kind of starting to fade in the, in the minds of filmmakers and they're getting serious about how I don't need to do that. I can, I can release my film online and be successful and make money and keep on doing what we're doing because we love it. Um, but there are so many options technologically what, with, with you know, all of the, the companies kind of be working with each other and developing, not working with each other, but developing camera systems that work for the, for the independent filmmakers. I think that's, it's, it's great now, it's going to get even better. Uh, Emily, we, um, at the finance panel yesterday, we were talking about crowdfunding and the context, in the context of one, you don't start your campaign and go out and try to raise money. There's a tremendous amount of work that precedes it where you're starting to engage and you're building a community. But also we talked a little bit about, which I would like you to share if possible, th the notion of when you start creating those materials and in the context of now shooting your film, how much are you thinking about in shooting your film still creating those marketing materials? Yeah. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to say you're spectacular and we got to talk more. <laughs> He's just so delightful. Um, so one of the things I, I always find on producer panels either that I'm lucky enough to be on or that I watch is that it tends to be a bunch of experienced producers saying to other producers, I know you're hyper competent and I know you're able to make game time decisions and I know you're uh, you know, really confident in your ability to like make stuff happen, <laughs> but don't forget to ask for help in these really important areas. I feel like that's sort of what happened all along the way here. Um, don't forget to ask for help in really important areas. Um, and uh, what crowdfunding is really about to me, there's sort of two things. Number one is it's asking for help from your end consumer. It's asking for help from your audience. Um, but the way that you do that to get them involved is actually more about offering them something that's really, really exciting, um, even when it's still sort of a, 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 a seedling in your mind, if you will. 
because we're Seed and Spark, and that was <laughs> an <laughs> accidental plug. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm going to keep it. Um, uh, so the first thing is really about getting your audience engaged early. And the second thing that I think is really important about crowdfunding is it's the first time in the history of movies that the producers become the rock stars. Um, the, when you go to the theater, the, um, the, the, cele the actors are the rock stars. And when you're online looking for stuff, the sort of the film title is the rock star. And when you go to film festivals, the director is the rock star. And the producers, who are the only people who have to live for the entire lifetime of the film, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> Except for right now, basically. Um, and um, having had that experience, it can be you know, sort of frustrating. And some of it is because we actually prefer to be, we're such control freaks, we prefer to be making the decisions that, than getting credit for them. Um, <clears throat> And some of it is that um, the role of the producer in um, initiating audience engagement has changed. And that's what's really exciting to me, that your presence on social media um, and your vision and your optic on the world, which is how you pick projects, and it's how you execute projects, and it's who you work with, your role as a producer is a point of view in filmmaking that people want to follow. And um, as as producers get more and more comfortable with that, I think um, they're seeing huge advantages. How many of you have heard of Manette Louie? Okay, so she's one of the most impressive humans I've ever met in my life. Um, she currently has a film in wide release, uh, Cold Comes the Night, starring Brian Cranston, and a film that just premiered to unbelievable critical acclaim at the festival called Land Ho. And I'm friends with her on Facebook, and I follow her on Twitter, and I read what she blogs about um, <coughs> because I really admire her work. But she has such an intense following for what she does and is so unafraid of building it that when she releases a movie, there are thousands of people who are like, Manette Louis movie is coming out. She's managed to become the personality that drives her films, and I think it's really, really important, and I know that's right up your alley. Well, just one really interesting Manette Louis story that recently happened. Uh, for for the, the film that's in theaters right now, she literally checked into the theater on Foursquare, and it was torrential downpour in New York, and in her check-in on Foursquare, told everyone, make sure you watch it on VOD if you're staying home tonight. And that was amazing to me, that she literally, at the theater, was just constantly promoting, just watch it, watch it, watch it, and that Anywhere. was just amazing. She, yeah, just love that story. Uh, I just want to hit the international uh, uh, filmmaking one more time, because for all of you, when you see Copenhagen, you're going to see a young actress, uh, not American, not someone that I would have had any access to, and I just, Moral, if you could just tell us how you, you know, the whole casting of a, a, a foreign actress, and although the film was produced there, how you went about that, please. Sure. Um, we also, at the very beginning, met up with a lot of casting directors in Denmark. We didn't really know Danish cast, so we wanted to rely on someone that knew that very well, so um, we were lucky to get a good casting director, and he just brought in different actresses and it works a little bit different in Denmark than in the US that we had casting sessions that were more kind of as um, um, callbacks so we have a few chapters actress like 45 minutes and the direc director really had some time to work and as soon as Frederica came in and she didn't really know the text she wasn't really prepared in the US it would be immediately like okay red flags raising but she just had such a charm and energy to it that both Mark and I were immediately like okay I think we have our actress so, so you somehow found Danish casting directors from New York no it was a Danish casting director in Copenhagen no no but how did you find the casting director I mean all through context I mean we just literally I think by now I probably know the whole Danish film community so <laughs> <laughs> It's really like we went everywhere, basically pitched our film, and then whoever wanted to do it for no money. That's um, great. Did it. So and just maybe on yeah, that, please. in general, um, the entire US cast that we had wasn't really US because we couldn't afford the SAG um, rule. I mean, as soon as you shoot abroad, you can't do the low budget agreement, and it was ridiculously expensive, so we just cast out of the UK. That was how we. Uh, so, I mean, it was a no brainer at that point that we knew that. That's we interesting. Just could meet the budget. Are there any more screenings? Yeah, the next screen. We have one more screening left tonight at 7. 6.55 up at Treasure Mountain Inn.
<laughs> Everyone should see it. So we've talked in one form or another about uh, uh, pressure on budgets that include, you know, but but the necessity for taking care of a lot of the things that you have to early on because it'll come back to haunt you later. There, I, I'm going to ask each of you just to shout out. I'll start with Jake. Um, the things that you look for most particularly in order because the line item. The line item for legal, of course, is shrinking with everything else. So what is it from our perspective as lawyers that we look to in order for it to actually work out um, while the budgets are shrinking? Yeah, for us, the key is having an experienced line producer on the film um, you know, who can negotiate the business terms uh, of your key agreements with our, our council, of course, but uh, we're going to be able to charge you a lot less if you have an experienced line producer who can handle some of those negotiations and who can be the one who is uh, sending documents back and forth, um, and it lets us help uh, you most efficiently. Right, that's in the context of not just talent agreements, location agreements, licensing of third party material, all the things, you know, doing much of the work for the E&O application before engaging the lawyer. So the more experience, that's actually to what uh, James and Alex said early on when they were looking at projects, they said the production team, I guess this is consistent with that, which you, part of your production team has to be able to have, you know, someone in the team, line produ producer typically, have tremendous amount of experience, has done this many times, either shot, you know, uh, pursuant to a, uh, uh, an agreement with the various unions wherever you're shooting, or having shot in certain locations, having, you know, done all of this numerous times will, will help the production enormously. Um, Stephen, what's our timing? Are we open to questions now, or should we? <coughs> Let's open it up to questions. And, and comments, because there are some really, really uh, successful producers here today. And so they may have some insights to share as well. Please do. Can I have come up with a mic or we should repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I have a question about budgets. Um, so given the marketplace and the diminished uh, options or, or chances of getting a minimum guarantee, whether you're, you're here at Sundance or another major festival, what, uh, at what point should um, should you be looking at budgets with an eye towards the marketplace? Is it, is it all about the script, or should we be thinking about other things, too? Anyway. Well, um, as far as, again, you know, to reiterate, as far as, as we go and, and when we, we sign on to a project, we did a film... Everybody, the director, we always said, it, oh, it's a little film. It's a little film. The film was Any Day Now with Alan Cumming and Garrett Dillahunt. Here was this film that we did in 23 days under a million dollars and proceeded to go on and win, starting with Tribeca and won 13 festivals. So it's really, again, to me, it's, about, it's more about content, um, which is, again, why this, this project to me with Alzheimer's in my bare hands is, is important. Uh, just to be made... So as, as budget goes, yes, line producers are everything. And you know, at the end of the day, that's what it's, you know, that's what it's all about. But really, again, for its content and message in a film, and that's what makes independent films so fabulous. So the, the rule of thumb that I, I like to follow and I encourage uh, the, the production teams I always work with is that dollar one should be spent on legal. Not just saying that because there's lawyers all over the place right now. Uh, and dollar two should be spent on marketing. Uh, and that's the thing that, that a lot of people ultimately, uh, they don't, either don't embrace or it, it's difficult to, to say, typically as a creative producer, where you, you don't handle the marketing and distribution yourself because um, you're either not taught that or you just Honestly, it's, it's not what you want to do as a, as a producer or as a filmmaker. Um, but if you could have a part of your team ultimately handling uh, marketing and distribution and developing that strategy early on, then that's all the more power to you. Um, and when you when you look at uh, and, you know this this rule of thumb, you know legal and then marketing, you know where where I ultimately saw this was just in the startup community. Uh, and you really look at it when different products, different apps, uh, different hardware, whatever it ultimately is, you know the 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 companies that are the winners aren't always necessarily the ones that have you know the best solution or the best tech. A lot of the times, it's the one that have the best marketing. Um, now, of course, if the product sucks, then that would all crumble to the ground. But 
when you look at two products that are almost identical, the one who has better marketing is always going to be the one who wins. And you know, that's something we see regularly in the film industry now. You know, why why is it that uh, Transformers can get uh, a, a higher box office than you know uh, any indie film. Well, it's because of the marketing, honestly. Yeah, I I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, and I would also say. Um, you have to start looking at what's happening to the films that sell at Sundance. Um, we uh, just launched something called Bright Ideas Magazine, and in it is this amazing data visualization. We collaborated with Accurate Studio, which is an Italian data visualization firm that looked at the last three years of films that sold at Sundance. And um, I really encourage you to, to take a look at it. It's now on like IndieWire and Filmmaker. Everybody's picked it up. It's just called Selling at Sundance. Um, and what's really interesting about it is that um, you will look and you will see that there is a certain budget size, over two million, um, that just doesn't perform well at box office by and large. There are some exceptions, and I wouldn't take those as, but if they can do it, I can do it. I think one of the challenges that as producers we have always had that the tech industry does not have is the tech industry has been much more transparent about its failures and about its numbers and about its data than we have been able to be because there are so many players who are incentivized not to be trans, uh, not to be transparent. Cable VOD doesn't want to tell you. Um, a lot of the online platforms don't want to tell you. And frankly, as producers, how many times have you picked comps in your packaging that are like clearly just the standout like lottery winners of the year? We've all done it. Um, so I would just encourage you to really look around on the internet when you're considering budgets and see that there is a giant tranche of films in the like two to $10 million range that have a really statistically low average of making any money back. So if that's the case, um, can you make a $5 million film with a great cast that blows everyone away? Yes. Is it likely? No, it's not. So uh, all I'm saying is that it, given that environment, can you do something like, I mean, that is a coup, but a couple of the best films of the past five years have been made for under a million dollars. Fruitvale Station was $990,000, just under a million. But I think that's really, really important to remember. Actors are looking for great projects to work on. Crew is looking for great projects to work on. Are they getting rich? No, but they're being paid a living wage, which frankly might be all we can really hope for moving forward. Yeah, I just want to underscore that in one thing. We, we represent a number of actors as well. And the, the notion for a long time was, well, if you have a certain cast, your foreign pre-sale numbers are going to give you, you're going to have estimates, and, and there was this, this kind of galloping forward by if you're cast and you have the right cast, you're going to be able to go with the kind of numbers uh, uh, that she just mentioned. That really isn't the case, and I'll tell you from the actor's perspective all the time, we'll get calls from managers or agents who are saying, you know, they're a little beleaguered about it, but they're like, there's this wonderful script, our actor really wants to do it, there's absolutely no money. But, but it still happens. And so the, the, the notion of having to pay to get that great cast, which sometimes you do, but, but the, the greater, and I'm not a producer, okay, but we just make deals and see them all the time. The, the, the notion of the better cast, therefore bigger number, which means I'm gonna have a better opportunity to sell it, isn't necessarily the case at all. Any other questions out there, guys? Uh, the question is, what advice do we have for producers wanting to build social media? Because as Stephen build to build their audience, because as Stephen said, it's really uh, it can be really intimidating. Um, well, first of all, it basically means we've tacked a new piece of pre-production onto all of our projects, right? Um, and that is the initiation of the social media outreach. Now. If, as a producer, like Manette, for example, you're building your own following by being a part of the conversation about producing, by contributing to the community that you work in, by helping others, um, you will already have initiated a following for any project because you're bringing your following with you. So I, I w what I would encourage everyone to do is to actually be concentrated on their own social media outreach as a career path not as a per project, uh, not just as per project. And not every project is going to warrant its own Twitter feed. And it's, I mean, you do your own Facebook page because there's a billion people on Facebook and ignore them at your own risk. Um, but I think it's, 
it's very, very difficult to build up a really active Twitter following. It takes a long time. And um, not everybody will be able to do it as excellently as Justin Simeon did with Dear White People, which just as a note, I mean, he's a writer, director, he's not the producer of the film, he's a producer of the dream, is when he had the notion of the film in his mind, he, he, he created the Dear White People tweet and tweeted in the voice of his female main character. And the reactions to that Twitter account were part of what helped inform the way, the way that he went about writing the script. So um, that is one avenue, but that's really, also, when you're looking at what scripts are you looking at and what team am I working with, their social media reach actually matters these days. I'm not saying work with an asshole with 10,000 followers, but um, probably if they have 10,000 followers, it's because there's something really cool going on about them, and that's um, and they understand something about their audience. So I, I just think it's a it's a career long path. It's not a per project undertaking. I think you also really need, <clears throat> I'm sorry, to be generous. Um, you can't just sell, sell, sell. Nobody wants that. You need to be giving away free content. You need to be supporting other people and other projects and shouting out other great things and resources and tools that, that people can also use because you can't just sell to them. You need to be generous and inclusive. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I would imagine nobody in here would think to do is engage your partners. And I mean, Ableson is, we have a modest Twitter following, but you know, when we, when we back projects that we, that we feel are, you know, are, are projects that we want to be involved with, we tweet, we tweet till we can't tweet anymore. And we've, you know, our following is, is, is gaining some traction and I'm sure we're not the only ones doing it. You know, so it's, it, that's a way to, to, to get your sort of the, 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 the ground level of your social media platform is engage your vendors. Um, we, we do it all the time. I feel like a lot of people forget that the word social is in social media. And, you know, the, the, the easy thing to think about, okay, so Twitter, what you really want to try to get um, when you tweet a piece of content out, you, you, you use Twitter as a form of marketing. You want to get retweets. You want to get people sharing it. Um, you don't really care about favorites. If someone you know, clicks a little favorite star, that's not really spreading virally in any way. So when you think about Facebook, it's again the same thing. You know, Likes are important, but how many people are sharing your content, engaging with your content, and engaging with you? Uh, that is the most important thing. So it's, you know, uh, like when I would post some news about, you know, a movie or something I was working on, you know, on uh, my one of my company's Facebook pages. You know, we get a couple little likes or comments and whatever. And then when I would do it on my my personal page, I'd get a bunch of people saying, "Oh my God, congrats! That's so great! That's so great!" Um, it just kind of shows shows the, the the point that you know when you're just kind of spreading news through social media and announcements, it's like you know only your friends are going to say oh congratulations. But if you know you put out a, a viral video, you know you you take you know a couple thousand dollars and you uh, uh, rig up a coffee shop to make it look like a girl's going to have a, a telekinesis freak out, and then you throw hashtag carry at the end of it, that goes a long way because now everyone's sharing it saying, check out this crazy video, isn't this insane, oh my god, this is great. And the conversion of people that are going to look that and then say, okay, I want to check out Carrie now is going to be much higher than, you know, posting something that just says, go see Carrie this weekend. So the question is, are, is there a resource where you can find out what the best distribution for company for your project is? And I believe that the best resource is other producers or other projects who have worked with those distributors. You need to talk about to them about what their experience is because obviously if you talk to the distribution company, they're going to tell you that, that they're the best and they're the right ones, but you need to talk to the people who've used them and find out what their experiences were. And it's not a... It's not unlike when you're putting your package together initially um, and you're looking at comps, right? When, when the film is done, look at comps and see who they got picked up by and see what they did with them. And, um, and, and also, I think more importantly, um, you can't produce a film if you cannot answer the question, who is my audience and what inspires them? Because if you can't answer those questions, you have no hope of even advising your distributor who is going to look to you to tell them who is your audience and what inspires them. Um, so that's a that's really that will help you 
answer those questions will also help you hang on to um, some rights. Because you know we have more freedom now than ever before to carve out things. And if you really know where your audience is online, for example, keep your digital or keep your ancillary and connect with them directly and let the distributor take care of the theatrical, should you be so lucky, you know what I mean? Um, but th I mean, that's really what's exciting about now is like we can we can find them ourselves. I would just like to add to that discussion about how to figure out who best to approach. I think a good lawyer who's really connected, understands your project, is going to understand the contracts that you're going to deal with and understand who the distributors are can really help you as much as a good sales agent and they may not take a percentage for the, of the film forever. You, it might be more upfront cost but at least you won't be losing that perpetual percentage of your time. Uh, thank you very much for attending. This was a lot of fun and hope uh, you yeah. got it. Yeah, let's give a big hand for the panel. I want to thank FWRB for putting the panel together. I hope you learned as much as I did. I learned a lot.